In this video, we will be discussing the enthalpy changes that occur in combustion. And as a bit of extension, we'll also talk about changes in neutralization reactions. For the last section, we'll talk about calculations using the formula Q equals MCAT, and also about calorimetry. So what is combustion? In module 3, we would have learned that combustion is a type of reaction that occurs between a combustible chemical and an oxidizer, usually oxygen. The product which results from combustion is dependent on the availability of oxygen gas supplied to said reaction. As a result of that, we end up having two different types of combustion reactions. One of them is called the complete combustion, and this occurs when there is enough oxygen, leading to a formation of carbon dioxide and water. The other one, where we don't have enough oxygen, is what we call incomplete combustion, and there is a production of carbon monoxide and soot or solid carbon particles. Here we have an example of a combustion reaction, which is a hydrocarbon propane being combusted with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now what we can notice from this reaction is there is an absence of carbon monoxide and carbon soot. As a result of that, what we should notice is that this is going to be an example of a complete combustion reaction. If we are given the bond energies for the formation or breaking of the different types of bonds in a reaction, we are able to determine the thermochemical nature of that reaction. Now in this scenario, the combustion of an alcohol will require the breaking of the CC and CH bonds of which the bond energies are given on this table on the right hand side. The formation of CO2 will involve the formation of the CO double bonds given here and these OH bonds for the formation of H2O given here. What we can do to calculate the total bond energy is if we add up all the total bonds which are broken and formed, we multiply them by their respective bond energies and then sum them up. In the case of the combustion of alcohol, we will find that more energy is going to be released than that which is absorbed. Again, as per module 3, we should know that a reaction between an acid and a base will form salt and water. Now these acid-base reactions occur where there is a transfer of H plus ions between the acid and base. Most bases, including the common bases sodium hydroxide or even calcium hydroxide, will contain these hydroxide ions given as OH-. And because there is a transfer of H from the acid to the base, we get the formation of water. Here we have an example of an acid-base reaction where the acid is reacting with water to form the hydronium ion and the chloride ions. Notice that the hydrogen ions from the HCO have been donated to the H2O which contains the hydroxide. Here is a table of common acids. There are the anions which are formed from these acids and also the typical salt which can be found when they are reacted with a base. Now an acid carbonate reaction is also a type of neutralization reaction and so we should expect the formation of the salt and water. But what is different about these carbonate reactions is that we have the formation of carbon dioxide which comes from the CO32- carbonate ion which is found in these carbonates. All neutralization reactions are exothermic and the reason for that is because we are forming covalent bonds between H plus and OH- ions. If we recall, bond formation is exothermic since it's releasing energy, while bond breaking is endothermic because it absorbs energy. Notice that a neutralization reaction with an acid of a higher particity will yield a greater energy release, and thus is more exothermic. The particity of an acid refers to the number of hydrogens which it is able to donate to react with the base. In the case of HCl, it is monoprotic since there is only one hydrogen that is available, whereas something like sulfuric acid has two, so it is diprotic. You will learn more about acids and bases in Year 12 HSC Chemistry, Module 6, Acids and Bases. A calorimeter is an apparatus which is used to measure heat changes. This is done by attaching a thermometer to an insulated vessel surrounding a reaction mixture. By doing this, we can measure the temperature change and from there calculate the enthalpy change. Now industrially, we would use an apparatus which is called a bomb calorimeter. But in school, we conduct this using the so-called coffee cup calorimeter which is demonstrated on the left hand side here. This coffee cup calorimeter experiment is where a styrofoam cup is used because it has a low heat capacity, a low heat cost and ultimately is cheap. When neutralization occurs, 
The energy which is produced by the exothermic reaction becomes absorbed by the water. This energy which is absorbed is measured as temperature and so we notice that in a system such as this one on the left hand side, the temperature of the water increases. For this reaction, once we have observed a temperature change, we can use the equation Q equals to mc delta T to calculate the total heat quantity, Q. Where m is going to be the mass of water, C is what we call the specific heat capacity of water, which is the amount of energy which is required to increase one gram of the substance by one degree. And finally, delta T is the change in temperature. So it's important to recognize that there are differences between delta H and Q. Delta H is the enthalpy change of a reaction and is given as energy absorbed or produced by a reaction per mole. For example here, we have this reaction between H and OH- which is going to produce HCl. And it produces 51.7 kilojoules per mole released. Q is different however, because it is the total energy which is absorbed or taken from water. We can see the relationship of delta H and Q as being delta H equals to minus Q over N, where N is the number of moles. Thus, our Q value is going to depend on the number of moles of reactant or product, and thus how many moles of water are formed from that neutralization. So let's look at an example here. If two moles of H2O were formed, using our relationship for delta H and Q, we would be able to work out the total heat quantity by multiplying the negative of the delta H value by 2. Let's go back to the calorimeter. Why does the quantity of heat equation work? Well, the energy that is being produced by the neutralization reaction is being absorbed by the water. That is going to lead to an increase in the temperature of water. And so we can use the Q equals to MC delta T equation to calculate the quantity of heat. Here is a list of assumptions that we make when conducting the coffee cup calorimeter experiment. The first assumption is that no energy is lost to the surroundings. This implies that we have a fully insulated system, but we know that because we're using styrofoam, it is not going to be completely isolated. We are still going to feel the styrofoam cup warming up in our hand when we are pouring a hot liquid into it, and that is an indicator. The second assumption is that the heat capacity of the neutralization solution is the same as water. Now again, there is a production of water from the neutralization, but the amount of energy that's required to raise the temperature of that solution is not necessarily true. And the final one is that the density of the solution is equivalent to the density of water. Again, we are producing a salt from the neutralization in the water, meaning that the solution inside the cup will no longer just be purely water.